Hello everyone, welcome to Future Cities Lab podcast. Here in Singapore, I'm your host, Andrew Stokels. Hello everyone, and welcome to Future Cities Lab podcast. Today I'm joined by Jason Alamu, who is a postdoctoral researcher with Natural Capital Singapore. And this project is looking to quantify the value of nature and the services nature provides to people in Singapore, and to try to better understand how planning practices can incorporate these understanding of value into uh, the process of development and planning in Singapore. So thank you uh, for joining us, Jason. Uh, thank you for having me. So today uh, we're going to be talking about a specific aspect of this research that Natural Capital Singapore is working on. They've been pioneering the use of social media to actually study how people use nature and interact with nature. So could you tell us a little bit more about this uh, research project and why uh, it's an important part of your larger project? Uh, Singapore is a, 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 an urban city. And I guess as an as a urban planner, or the challenge before urban planners it's how best they can incorporate um, a number of ecosystem services and ecosystem services would be the benefits that people derive from nature um, within planning and design and probably one of the more important ones um, currently um, I guess planners are trying to uh, incorporate uh, would be cultural services uh, which would be things like tourism and recreation so think about parks think about um, urban forests, um, think about coastal areas, think about the activities you have there, think about the infrastructure that has to go in place for you to enjoy those environments. Um, and one of the ways of, I guess, helping these planners, and there are a number of different methods, but one of the ways that you can do that in uh, both a spatial and temporal sense uh, is using data from social media, looking at the preferences of people based on their pictures, um, as to what attributes of nature, uh, whether it's coastal, whether it's city, um, that they seem to prefer. And how can we build those features into either areas that are not used as well, or how do we improve existing areas such that more people can benefit? So it sounds like what you're saying is that there's certain benefits from ecosystems, ecosystem services that are not actually uh, economic directly. But is that true? Are you looking at, say, economic benefits from tourism? Or are there certain benefits that are harder to quantify and more subjective? Yeah, so <clears throat> there are a number of different types of services. And we will be using both um, economic and non-economic, or rather say monetary and non-monetary. Okay. So some of the more traditional ones that we think of would be like provisioning services. That would be like, like timber or food, for example. There's a market value for that. Um, other services, reg uh, regulating services, like hazard protection, like what a coral reef, for example, might do to the shoreline or mangrove. Or even in terms of air quality regulation, what trees do for filtering um, fine particles from the air, right. um, that too is another service that we benefit from. But then you have these non-material services that are a bit more difficult to quantify. And yes, you could use monetary methods, but these monetary assumptions don't necessarily hold true. So while um, their methods such as travel cost, um, the various choice experiments, contingent valuation, etc. type methods to quantify the value of, of recreation, of the aesthetic value, of the, the bequest value, of the spiritual value of nature, it does not really truly reflect the value of, say, a forest or a coastal space um, culturally to people that may have um, benefited from that mm. in so many different ways over generations. So mm. there will be these other methods, these non-monetary methods that we would use. Um, and they are subjective, you know, they're based on preferences, um, but uh, together with the monetary, they give you a better reflection of the mm. values of which people place mm. on these systems, both for themselves now and future generations. Yeah. And in Singapore, which is obviously a, a land-scarce territory, that's one of the things we've talked about with a lot of researchers, it seems to come up, is that all the, all the projects kind of uh, come up with this idea that Singapore is very limited and hence all the decisions have to be made in a very careful way. 
So when you think about that, you take that into consideration, the value of different places in Singapore probably takes on a lot more importance um, than in certain areas where there may be more options for people in terms of recreation and open space, right? Yeah, I think um, I think actually Singapore has been um, has been quite clever with that. So because of because of it being land scarce, it's had to optimize how it uses space and it's had to think non traditionally mm. of some of these services where um, where countries that have the space uh, would maybe go to a slower pace. Uh, but here, uh, because land is scarce, you know, you've had to think non-traditionally, look at different types of services, how they could fit into different spaces and benefit as wide a range of people mm -hmm. over as wide an area as space, uh, over as wide an area as possible. Right. Um, while at the same time, um, allowing for economic growth um, for the people as well. So in Singapore, even though uh, much of the island is built up. There's still a lot of nature and open spaces. So people um, think about Singapore, right, like a very managed nature, but um, some of the spaces are actually still reserved for, for natural uh, kind of wild nature. So uh, the spaces that you're examining in this research, um, do they often fall into the category of parks, or planned parks, or some of them also uh, open spaces or kind of preserves? Yeah, all spaces. Mm -hmm. um, so some are plot. Some are planned, some are not planned. Okay. Um, so planned spaces, I guess, fall more within, um, I guess, an urban planning um, framework. Mm -hmm. um, the, the open spaces, um, I guess, uh, communal spaces, yeah. I guess. Um, so because there's no clear plan, they still offer value. Mm -hmm. um, so in a Singapore context, um, just to give an example, um, there's such a, a rich diversity of people here. So. So you mentioned that different groups and different people use the parks in different ways. So that's something that these methods might help uh, understand, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I guess a, a function of, um, of soft biases, I guess your your background, um, it could be socioeconomic, it could be the story your grandfather told you as a child, it could be anything. Mm. Um, you would have preferences for different environments. Um, some of them could fall within um, managed recreational parks, um, whether they're forests, whether they're coasts. Um, others could be open spaces. Um, what we find are, even here in Singapore, um, there are different social groups that tend to congregate uh, in, in open spaces, open communal spaces, because mm. uh, it's an opportunity to bond with family, etc. Um, as opposed to maybe the, the congestion of popularity um, of the recreational parks, which may be um, too dense for some and take away from the, uh, the communalness of the family bonding. So it varies from, from group to group. Okay. So uh, can you give an example of some of the locations that you've looked at through these uh, studies of social media? Oh, so uh, there was a study done um, in around mid-2010s, I want to say around 2015, thereabouts. Um, by uh, Richards and Fries. Mm. Um, they looked at the mangroves, uh, northern mangroves of um, Singapore. So I'm thinking specifically of the mangroves in Ugin, for example, but there's some others that they had looked at. In Pula Ugin. In Pula Ugin, okay. yes, yes. Um, and this would be one of the more popular mangrove systems. Um, uh, it's visited fairly frequently, especially on the weekends, um, by various groups of people. It's mm. always busy. <laughs> And, you know, interesting factoid um, about Singapore, uh, it has one of the highest phone data and social media usages right. of any place in the world. Um, the statistic I read recently um, estimated that uh, every 7 out of 10 person uh, is on social media here. At any given time. At any given time. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the actual percent they gave was 77%. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, just to put that in context, uh, you have this high density, high traffic of people, ready availability of data, phone devices, right. ready ability to be connected both to your friends and family here and abroad. And you want to share this experience. Mm -hmm. You want to share your, whether you're aware of it or not, this connection. So you leave from your home, you go to this, to this mangrove environment to experience nature, whether it's a cycle, whether it's to walk, whether it's to be away from the city. Mm -hmm whether it's the bond with friends, spirituality, any reason, and you take a picture and you send it to a friend, you post it on Flickr, you post it on any one of these social media um, 
outlets. Um, and some of them, some of these outlets, they, they, they allow, within reason, um, scientists to extract some metadata from that. Right. Meaning, um, a lot of these pictures tend to be georeferenced, geotagged. All right? So you're standing in this mangrove, you take a picture, and with this geotag locate, um, information, we can actually plot a map indicating that, oh yeah, there's someone who just took a picture in this area. When we look at the picture, we can see the characteristics of the environment. Did they take the picture with the uh, with a seawall to their back? Uh, was the ocean to their back? Was a mangrove to the back? Were, was there a lot of litter? Were there benches? Were there a lot of amenities? Were they standing in a muddy area? Were they looking happy? Were they frustrated? Were they complaining? Um, were there any other cultural artifacts there? From these various attributes within the image, and we need lots of images to do this, of course. Um, we're able to uh, look at, I guess, correlations between the, the attributes of the landscape and we make the assumption that the person taking the picture, you know, has some preference for the area. So between their preference mm -hmm. and the attributes of the landscape, and if there are positive relationships, then that might be an indicator of, well, these features probably encourage more people mm -hmm. to go to this area for whatever reason. And maybe these are features we should probably try to enhance elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Uh, in some instances, for example, one component of the work that, uh, that NatCap is doing, um, they're looking at an aspect of nature that's called disservices. Right. Now, nature generally has very positive services to human well-being. We feel good in nature generally. But there's some aspects of nature that may have a negative impact. Um, for example, there are odors that come from mangroves, um, some diseases, for example. Um, and... Litter being one of them, I mean, we live in a, in a human-touched, human-modified world. You know, mm. you look into the ocean, um, plastics isn't in the news all the time. This stuff washes up on shore. So one of the, um, one of the services that, that mangroves and coastal ecosystems offer, for example, is they trap sediment, okay. right, which helps to stabilize and build your shoreline, yeah. right, which helps to protect um, people and property. But with loss of litter, it also traps this litter, mm -hmm. which reduces the aesthetic, which reduces or can have a negative impact on your um, your cultural experience that you're having there, a negative experience, mm -hmm. a disservice. So if you find people's pictures, for example, contain images of litter, this might actually be an indicator that this particular area is being not maintained or actually contributing something negative to the yeah. space. Yeah, so when you look at the frequency of pictures, how many people go to that area, and then you look at the amount of lit in the back, it's, and I mentioned it before, um, it's a easier way, spatially, all right, to get a lot of information about areas and people's preferences. If we had to do this otherwise, it would be a very time-consuming process and it would probably be aspatial. Okay. Because you would have to do a lot of surveys, a lot of interviews, um, which has a lot of subjectivity. And this method does have some subject some subjectivity as well. Because when you think about it, um, there are biases in terms of geography. Yeah. Um, there are biases in terms of age. Um, Younger folks generally tend to be yeah. a bit more tech savvy and will post more yeah. online than um, not so young people. Right. And the more popular areas will, of course, get right. uh, the most pictures taken. You know, so there are some biases there, a limitation within the method. But um, but on the other hand, um, in terms of going out, I and mean, there's value in interviewing people. Mm. You just can't cover the range and pick up that broad diversity of perceptions mm. that you really need to make meaningful decisions or to inform mm. um, planning and design uh, meaningfully. So uh, Justin, as you mentioned this uh, technique, I can't help but imagine that as people Instagram more and, and post things, that something like this might actually lead planners and designers to start designing environments for what people want to post on social media. Um, is this a danger in a way for this kind of research or do you think that ultimately um, it allows us to better understand what people actually want? Uh, I'd say yes and no. So um, 
in a we live, or at least we're moving in a trajectory towards um, a more urbanized environment. Right? We have a lot more people living in concretized environments. And you have high density of people that still want to interact with some aspect of nature, um, whether directly or indirectly. Um, so imagine you have a city and you have a park. And everyone, there's a, a forest park. And everyone wants to go to this forest park for a number of different reasons. Um, and as the city grows, that same park would be under greater and greater stress. I think coming out of these these exercises, um, studies like these, where we're able to to identify particular attributes of the ecosystems that the people have preferences for, because of course not all aspects will will appeal to everyone, but we we extract those most salient ones and not to replace nature but we create a, a surrogate, I guess, to try to offset some of those impacts. So um, some of the skyscrapers, for example, could offer some of the same services. So for example, um, forests, they provide um, habitat for different types of birds and butterflies. They also provide shade, cooling effect, um, air quality purification, etc. cetera. Um, to an extent, uh, Planting trees in and around um, uh, in and around skyscrapers or green walls, where you have an entire wall of a building that may be vined, um, having gardens on rooftops, etc. Um, they offer similar services, uh, maybe to the same extent, maybe more, maybe less. Mm -hmm. It all depends upon management, but fundamentally the same service, which. Um, is still offered to yeah. that growing population, yeah. thus offsetting some of the, um, the the damages, for want of a better word, that the natural ecosystem, the natural landscape itself, um, uh -huh. may be faced with. So it's not just about preserving what's already there, it's also about how do we design open spaces, recreational spaces for yeah. the future. Yeah, exactly. And integrated exactly. with the buildings and cities. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So Singapore has been very active in this uh, mandating that buildings replace a certain amount of green space that they took up in construction actually on the building or on the roof in these mid-level greenery areas, podium spaces. Um, this is something that uh, other researchers are actually researching here, but I guess this is what some of what you're talking about as well. Is yeah. These sorts of this, this would be the application, I guess, of the Natural Capital Project. Right. Well, thank you very much, Jocelyn, for that. That's a really interesting topic, and uh, it opens up a whole new range of possibilities, I think, in terms of the relationship between internet use, social media, and how people interact with nature. It's something that's not commonly uh, being talked about in terms of the application of social media, but it's clearly uh, an emerging area, I think, for research. You know, I think uh, when you look at it from a global perspective, um, but especially within cities, um, you know, we live in a digital age, uh, basically. It's, it's so easy um, to be connected to other people. You know, uh, we have phones, phones with cameras, but not only are we connecting with people, we're also connecting with our environment, we're connecting with nature in new and different ways. Mm -hmm. So this, I guess this is an opportunity for us, um, and, uh, we're just now starting um, to reveal uh, some of these preferences. Great. Thank you so much, and I hope to see you back soon to hear uh, more updates for your research. Thanks for having me.